Chapter 13 A Bushel of Neckties Sometime during the night, Cudai Higgins left Hangtown for parts unknown. In the days that followed Praiseworthy's name and reputation spread through the diggings, he was pointed out to new immigrants as someone of consequence, and Jack based, basked in reflected glory. The truth of the matter was that Praiseworthy himself began to enjoy his notoriety. And like chameleons, the two partners changed their colors to those of the Sierra Nevadas. They wore red miner's shirts and jack boots and wide-brimmed hats against the summer sun. After a week in the diggings, there was little of the butler left to be seen and praiseworthy, unless it was the straightness of his back and the quiet reserve of his glance. And then, as if to live up to his reputation, he stopped shaving. Within a few days, he began to look decidedly fierce. Jack collected four tin cans against the day when they would stake their claim. They bought a dust-stained canvas tent at the cheap John auction and pitched it beside Pitch Pine Billy's tent. All they lacked to go. Prospecting was a burrow and a grub stake of beans, bacon, flour, and coffee. They shoveled dirt and panned mud from morning till night. Pitch Pine Billy taught them every trick he knew, including the setting of flea traps. After dark, they filled their gold pans with soapy water and placed them beside a lighted candle struck, stuck in the dirt floor of the tent. The candle gets the varmints to jump in, Pitch Pine Billy exclaimed. About the only thing a flea ain't learned to do is to take a bath. They hop in that soap water and drown, but candles were a dollar each, and some of the miners preferred the fleas. There were days when a man was lucky to wash out enough spangles to pay for his grub. While an ounce of gold brought $16 far away in San Francisco, it was worth a mere $4 at the diggings. And it didn't buy much. Onions were $1.50 a pound. Supplies had to be frighted in, and prices were high. Salt pork sold for $0.50 cents an ounce. Gold dust seemed more plentiful than flour. Hay was weighed out at $0.08 cents a pound. Oh, I've seen some mighty fancy prices, laughed Pitch Pine Billy, frying up a loaf of bread in his gold pan. There was a fellow come to the diggin' with a jar of raisins. The boy ain't seen a raisin since they left home, and their mouths began to slabber. You'd think it was caviar in that jar. They, them raisins fetched their weight in gold dust, come to $4,000. Slowly, day by day, praiseworthy and Jack added to their grub stake. They had blankets, a dozen candles, and a coffee pot. One noon, Jack pulled up a tuft of grass, and a glint of light from the roots made him gasp. A nugget. And then his yell carried from one end of the raven to the other. A nugget! Praiseworthy dropped his gold pan, and Pitch Pine Billy squinted. Jimmy from town, who wore a mustache twisted into sharp points, came running over, and Buffalo John awoke from a sound sleep. Soon a dozen mine, miners had left their claims to stand around and admire Jack's catch. The lump of gold was the size of an acorn. It was trapped in the fine grass roots like a fly in a spider's web. Maybe it'll buy us a burrow, Jack grinned. Well, I don't know, smiled Pitch Pine Billy. The tail of a jackass, anyway. Buffalo John pulled the bandana off his head and polished the nugget. The miners passed it around, holding it up to the sun to watch it shine. And from that moment on, it became known as Jamoka Jack's Nugget. That night, Praiseworthy and Jack and Pitch Pine Billy went to town for supper. There was a letter waiting at the hotel from Dr. Buckby. It was written in a shaky hand. My dear friends, your letter finds me weakened by the yellow fever from Panama, and I can barely hold this pen steady. Curse that Higgins fellow and the gang of highwaymen you write of. I, since I cannot leave my bed, please act as my agents in the matter. If you are able to recover my map, I will make you partners in the mine, fifty-fifty. Act quickly, I beg of you, before all is lost. Praiseworthy finished reading the letter and folded it thoughtfully. A generous enough letter offer, he said to Jack, half interest in a gold mine. Jack's yellow eyebrows lifted. All they had to do was get on the trail of those road agents. We'll need guns, he said quickly. A four-shooter would fit fine in his belt along his horn spoon and buckspin pouch. Maybe he could trade his nugget for a pistol. Praiseworthy scratched through the stubble, gro stubble growing out of his face. What we need is a burrow. A burrow to chase outlaws? Asked said Jack. 
praiseworthy put the letter in his shirt pocket. He shook his head. We've no time for such speculations. First, those vultures no doubt ripped open Karayagin's coat and discovered the map. Second, they may already have located the mine by now. Maps, Pitch Pine Billy laughed. Why, there are so many maps floating around the diggings. You could paper a room with them. Boys, let's see. They ordered hangtown fries, platters of bacon, canned oysters and eggs. Praiseworthy turned to Jack. What do you want to drink? Jack glanced up at the waiter. Coffee, he said. Coffee, sir, with a few acorns ground up. After dinner, Praiseworthy stayed behind in the hotel lobby to reply to Dr. Buckby's letter. Jack and Pitchpine Billy went wandering along the streets to see the sights. The auction bell rang to, began to clang. Maybe Cheap John would have pistols to sell. Jack thought, let's go, he said. Don't mind, said Pitchpine Billy. The auctioneer placed a keg of salt butter outside their brightly lit tent, and the miners gathered around this del delicacy like flies. The unclasped they unclasped their jackknives and carved off butter shavings and ate them off their blades. Between the ringing of the bell and the free butter, a crowd had formed and the sale began. Frenchmen rubbed shoulders with Sonorians and Chileans and with Germans and Missourians, with Yankees and Englishmen, with can Canicus from the Sandwich Islands. There were sailors who had deserted their ships to run off to the miners, mines, and soldiers who had left their garrisons at Monterey and San Francisco. The auctioneer mounted a barrel at the rear of the tent. He was a paunchy man in an open vest and a plug hat. What, what'll you take for the hat, cheap John? Someone yelled. Ain't for sale, said the auctioneer, but I got ten pounds of Chinese sugar, that is. What am I bid? Gents, who'll give me a dollar a pound? Dollar, 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 dollar. I got a dollar. Who'll give me a dollar and a half? Half, half, half. Two dollars, and I bid two dollars. Boys, two, two. Dos pesos, said a Spaniard with silver buttons down his tra trouser legs. Jack waded through the sale of sugar, a wheelbarrow, tin pans, butcher knives, and a sack of dried apples. The auctioneer seemed to have no guns. The mines. The miners stood around, whittling and enjoying themselves. I got a bushel of neckties sent here by mistake, boys, said the cheap John. They fetch a dollar apiece back in the States. What'll you give me for this for the lot? Am I bid ten dollars? Am I bid nine dollars? Nine, nine? The miners stood grinning and whittling and silent. At that moment, Jimmy Jimmy from town spied Jack and Pitch Pine Billy. Let's go get something to eat, he said. My stomach feels like a cat in hates without claws. Nine, 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 called the auctioneer. We've done, said, Pe said Pitch Pine Billy. Done what? asked Jimmy, t Jimmy from town, twisting the ends of the mustache angrily. Eight, said Jack. Eight, 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 called the auctioneer. I'm bid eight dollars by the young feller with yellow eyebrows. Sold for eight dollars. Jack stood as if struck by lightning. The miners began to chuckle. Looks like you bought yourself a bushel of neckties, Jamoka Jack, laughed Pitch Pine Billy. But I said eight, not eight, Jack protested. That's what I heard you say. Eight, answered the Chief John, pushing the plug hat to the hat of his head. A T E. We ain't much on spelling around here. It was clear to everyone that the auctioneer hadn't expected to be able to sell the ties at all. You ain't going back on your word, are you? Can't do that, whispered Pitch Pine Billy. I'd rather see you break your leg than your word, boy. Pay up. The auctioneer was grinning. Why, you got them ties dirt cheap. Of course, we ain't much on tie wearing here at the diggings except to be buried in. And he burst out laughing. The miners looked upon the affair as harmless fun, but be able to stuff a pillow with them somehow, so, someone called out. Knot them together and lasso so chickens. Jack stepped up to the gold scale and put the buckskin pouch from his belt. The nugget tumbled out. He borrowed a knife and carved half of it away. Bit by bit, it hurt. The cl he clamped his jaws with anger. Then he picked up the bushel of neckties and worked his way through the crowd to the street. Ain't no sure. I'd even want to be buried in one of them things, a miner laughed. The praiseworthy was coming along the street from the hotel, and Jack could barely face him. He had cut two ounces of his nuggets that might have gone towards their grub steak or a gun. But even Pitch Pine Billy and Jimmy Jimmy from town were chuckling. What have you got here? Praiseworthy asked, raising one eyebrow. Neckties, 
Jack murmured. A whole bushel of them. Praiseworthy raised the other eyebrow. Neckties? Yes, sir. Jimmy from town loosened his gold pouch. I guess it was my fault. He smiled. I'll pay you for them ties. Jamoka Jack, as long as you don't make me wear one. Me either, grinned Pitchpine Billy. Praiseworthy held up his hand. Put away your dust. He looked at Jack. That was a fine purchase, he smiled. A brilliant purchase. Jack gazed up at Praiseworthy. What? We'll buy our mountain canary with neckties. Pitchpine Billy crimped an eye. You've gone out of your head, Bullwhip. Why, you couldn't give them things away in hang time. The only necktie you can get on a man is, ma is made out of rope. Praiseworthy scratched his short whiskers. They were, at, they were at an itchy stage. He smiled, half shutting one eye. Unless I miss my guess, every man in the diggings will come begging for a necktie in a day or two. They'll fight to get one. He picked up the bushel basket and swung it to his shoulder. Come along, partner. The next morning, Praiseworthy and Jack helped Pitch Pine Billy dig a coyote hole. Once we hit bedrock, there's no telling the riches down there, the miner declared. The spangles keep working and sifting through the ground. Earthquakes and all, it may take them 10,000 and one years to reach bedrock, but that stops them. By late afternoon, the big hole was deeper than Praiseworthy's head. They rigged up a rope and lifted out dirt by the bucket's fault. There were men all along the diggings, coyoteing for gold, and some of the shafts were as deep as wells. Jack took his turns at the bottom of the hole, filling buckets. They were emptied into the long tom. The long tom was a wooden sluice box um, set in the stream. Rushing water washed the dirt along a trough, and the bits of gold were trapped in iron rifles, riffles along the bottom. Praiseworthy kept silent about the neckties. Even by the end of the next day, there was no rush to buy them as he had predicted. But he remained unconcerned. Jack wondered if Praiseworthy had merely been trying to spare his feelings after the ridiculous purchase he'd made. He was glad to forget it and said no more. The following morning, a delegation of three men appeared on Pitchpine Billy's claim. Jack recognized Mr. Jonas T. Fletcher at once. The undertaker had bought two hangtown merchants with him. They came looking for Praiseworthy, who was at the bottom of the coyote hole. Jack and Pitchpine Billy hauled him out on a rope, and Praiseworthy looked as if he had been dipped in dust. It clung to his eyelashes as he blinked. If bedrock's any deeper, he said to Pitchpine Billy, we'll be digging for gold in China. Bullwhip, said the undertaker, you've got to uphold the fair name of hangtown. What's that? We've just been delivered a challenge. Praiseworthy began beating the dirt out of his slouch hat. Is that so? Yup, a fellow over at Grizzly Flats has heard about you. He says he can whip you. Jack looked up. Praiseworthy hardly blinked an eye. He merely continued knocking the dust out of his hat. Is that so, he said. Yup, of course, he don't know be from a bull's foot to make a statement like that. He ain't exactly bright, although I understand he can write his own name if you give him time enough. But he is a regular big fella. The Mountain Ox, they call him. Well, how about it? Doesn't sound like a fair match, said Praiseworthy. The undertaker nodded. He does have you on height and weight and reach and general meanness, I suppose. That's not what I mean, said Praiseworthy. It wouldn't be fair to him. The three gentlemen from Hangtown responded with a blank look. How's that? Even Jack was startled by Praiseworthy's declaration. The mountain ox sounded enormous. Praiseworthy wouldn't have a chance. Had he begun to believe his own reputation? From what you tell me, gentlemen, said Praiseworthy, the man can barely read and write. He'll be at a decided disadvantage. Pitchpine Billy pulled his hat down over his ears. Bullwhip, will you tell me what reading and writing has got to do with a bare knuckle fighting match? I suppose that remains to be seen. Then you'll fight him? The undertaker grinned. Not by chance, sir, said Praiseworthy, but if the fair name of Hangtown is at stake, I suppose I must. The delegation smiled. How about next Tuesday? Impossible. By next Tuesday, we'll have our burrow and grub stake and be far away prospecting. 
My partner and I have a fortune to make and time is running out. We'll be returning this way by the middle of August at the very least. You can plan the match for the 15th, sir. The three gentlemen from Hangtown nodded and departed. Jack gazed at Praiseworthy as if a complete stranger had been hiding through the years under the elegant manners of a butler. He was enchanted. But Pitchpine Billy whipped off his hat and jumped on it. Bull whip, he snorted. You've gone and lost your reason. Before the 15th day of, of next month shows up, you better make out your last will and, test, and testament. Jack had just lowered himself into the coyote hole when a sudden excitement spread through the diggings and he pulled himself out again. There was a shout of voices back and forth across the stream from claim to claim. Old Quartz Jackson is back and he's brought his new missus with him. Men dropped their shovels and gold pans and abandoned their long toms. Miners called out of coyote holes. What's that? Him and the lady is putting up at the hotel. The excitement even touched Pitch Pine Billy. Boys, he said to Praiseworthy and Jack, I ain't seen a lady in so long I near forgot what they look like. Praiseworthy uh, rested his arms on the handle of his shovel and grinned. He gave Jack a nod. This is a day we've been waiting for, partner. Watch and see. Pitch Pine Billy scowled. Well, don't just stand there and look at you both. Dirt sticking out on you like you ain't had a bath all year. Why, it's a disgrace. I'm ashamed of you. You heard what they said. There's a lady in town. Within five minutes, miners were everywhere along the stream, scrubbing and shouting and planning to go to town. Pitch Pine Billy waited in with his clothes and on and kept dumping hatloads of water over his head. Later, shirts and trousers could be seen on every bush drying out in the mountain heat. Men stood at mirrors tacked to trees and got out their straight razors. Half a dozen familiar beards disappeared. Others were trimmed and short. Praiseworthy took his time. When he and Jack emerged from their canvas tent, they were wearing bright green neckties. Pitchpine Billy stood fluffing out his beard. He stopped and he stared. Help yourself, said Praiseworthy. That is, if it's all right with my partner. If that's that, it's fine with me, said Jack. Pitchfine Billy grinned. Don't mind if I do. The neckties were so bright they could be seen across the river. Soon the miners who had laughed at Jack the night of the auction were swarming about the bushel basket. I'll give you a pinch of dust for one of them neckties, Jamaica Jack. I'll give you two pinches. Pitchpine Billy was laughing. Don't fight, boys. Just get in line here. There. Looks like Jamoka Jack has cornered the necktie market. He caught you sleeping, didn't he? Just hold your pouches open and I'll pinch out the gold since I got the biggest thumbs in the diggings. Praiseworthy stood idly by with his foot on a stump and lit a long nine cigar. Within 20 minutes, the basket was empty. Every necktie was gone. Pitch Pine Billy pulled the strings on Jack Jack's buckskin pouch and handed it over. It was heavy as a plummet. Jack weighed it in his hand and tossed the pouch to Praiseworthy. That ought to get us a burrow, he grinned. And maybe a gun, Praiseworthy said, taking the heft of it. He tossed the pouch back. Yes, sir, that cheap John had better learn be from a bull's foot to get the better of Jamoka Jack. Gents, let's go to town. The miners had formed a crowd outside the Empire Hotel, and when Quartz Jackson brought his lady out into the porch, the miners whipped off their hats as if it were the United States flag they were looking at. By the great horn spoon, Pitchpine Billy muttered it on, a genuine woman. She had sparkling eyes and a smile for everyone. Quartz Jackson wore a vest with a watch chain across it and looked proud enough to burst. We frighted up some cut lumber, he said. The missus and me, we're going to build a cabin and you boys are always welcome to drop in for tea. Ain't that right, Hannah? Hannah, Pitch Pine Billy murmured. Ain't that the prettiest name you ever heard? Quartz Jackson looked out over the crowd. He recognized Praiseworthy and Jack and gave them a nod. Step up, boys, and I'll introduce you. Make it fast before you strangle in them neckties.